Hi, everyone. Um, people are still joining us, but um, so what I'm aiming to cover today is ways you can get more information about census data so you can um, hone down what you want to look at. Um, some discussion about the potential geography. Uh, I'm not going to go as far as mapping, but I will show you how to arrive at a point where you've got data that can be loaded into um, a product like QGIS or ArcGIS for mapping purposes. Um, some discussion about the sources of data um, and a recommendation on where to go. At the end of that session, which is kind of giving out a lot of information, I'm going to have a break to, to answer any questions. So if you have any questions, if you pop them in the chat, in, into the Q&A, sorry, um, I'll pick those up then. And then we'll move on to looking at how to get the data together. Um, I'm going to take you through a demonstration of how to download the data and how to prepare it. Um, and then um, over to you again for questions. So first of all, sources of information. Um, this is the census page. So um, when you go into this page, uh, there is a useful set of information in the Census 2021 Dictionary. It brings a lot of things together. So it talks to you about the area type definitions, which I'll be covering um, to some extent in, in the presentation. It uses talks about the measurements. Again, I'll be talking about that, but we hold information about individuals, about households, and about dwelling spaces. And then details of each of the variables by topic with the with the potential breakdowns of them. So a useful kind of one stop shop to check uh, information. So just to kind of focus on what we've got, we we had a response rate of ninety seven percent for the twenty twenty one census, and more than eighty eight percent in all local authorities. Now, though this is great, it does mean that the numbers that are produced to estimates and may have some impact on some of your smaller populations. So for example, we know there's significant underrepresentation of the gypsy and traveler community, which does cast some kind of um, concerns about using the census data purely as the only method of understanding that community in a local area. Um, there was a comprehensive quality assurance process, a new thing for 2021, and the majority of local authorities took part in that. Um, there was then a coverage survey as ever used to estimate missing and double counting. One important thing, I mean, given that this was conducted during the pandemic, is that ONS have attempted to count students at their term time address, whether or not they were there. But it's likely to exclude some overseas students because they wouldn't have been resident in the UK. So they wouldn't have been picked up at all. Um, and one of the key findings, I think, you know, one of the key concerns I, in terms of funding for local authorities particularly was this kind of evidence of a temporary outflow for urban areas. So there's a number of documents. I've just summarized them here. And really, I'm not going to go through them in lots of detail, except to say that what the ONS did was compare what they got from the census with a number of different sources. So using admin based population estimates, mid year population estimates, the census coverage survey um, and at individual level. And they identified particular is issues with some groups um, and have made some corrections into uh, local authority estimates based on discussions about the real reasons for those, but probably not as much as some local authorities would have liked. So um, if, you want, if you're interested in that kind of quality information, there's reports there. A lot of them have used case studies of local authorities um, to demonstrate the things they found. So the next phase is thinking about your geography. And this is a, um, a kind of important part of, of deciding how you're gonna do your area profiling. And I think there's a lot of caveats around this that we'll come to later on. But first of all, we've got a kind of administrative geography, which, um, so on the left, we have a breakdown of Greater Manchester, um, there are 10 boroughs in Greater Manchester, physical representation of those. On the right, we've got one of those boroughs, Trafford, and it's broken down into two sets of things. So in terms of their governance, they run area committees for North, West, South and Central. And within those, they have um, bounded wards. So those wards are then included as part of um, 
they have an elected councillor, um, they have potentially budgets in some areas, and so on. And that kind of physical representation of those is a useful um, starting point for those of you who will be thinking about an area profile for a local area. The next one is just an example of the different ways we might um, look at this. On the left, we have a, have a physical representation of the UK general election results by constituency using a physical geography. So it looks like Labour is, it, the country is predominantly blue uh, of England, the country of Scotland is predominantly yellow, and Ireland, Northern Ireland is split between green and red, which I think are the Unionist and um, Sinn Féin representations. The next map takes a different approach and makes each constituency a hexagon. So they're of equal size, of equal weight, and that gives probably a more accurate representation of the result of um, that election. And then finally, the one on the right uses what's called a cartogram. And what this does is to distort the boundaries to reflect the population size. Now, this may be particularly useful if you're in an area where you have quite dense urban part and quite sparse rural parts. So if we went back to that map of Trafford, um, the, the previous one, um, you can see on the bottom left, Bowdoin is a large area, but there's significant parkland in that. So if you applied that cartogram measure, Bowdoin would shrink significantly, whereas the more populated parts like Sale, um, Stratford, Old Trafford would grow uh, proportionately as well. So those are different ways of doing that. I'm happy to, to talk about how you might do that, but um, it's not part of this course. So I can probably point you, but um, offline to sources of where you can work on that. And then we have the kind of statistical geography. Uh, this was introduced in 2001, and there were um, two real reasons. One was to produce a more homogeneous population by matching characteristics such as tenure and property type. And when you look at the root files for this, they have characteristics of the areas and they've broken them down into those. And the second aim was over time to minimize the changes. So there was more um, ability. So for those of you um, in many local authorities this year, you will have seen to, uh, with the 2021 data, you have seen significant changes from the ward structure in 2011. Um, and looking at change over time, comparing at ward level will not really give you the answer, whereas these, um, these measures are more consistent and ONS provide um, data on what's changed, what stayed the same, etc. So the building block is an output area. Um, it has a minimum of 40 households and a maximum of 250 households, uh, 100 residents and 625 people, and a target of around 125. So those are the kind of building blocks, and that's where the matching is done to create the homogeneity. Um, I would say all of these areas are bounded within local authorities, so though there might be lots of similarities across the boundaries between local authorities, those are not created as output areas or the larger super output areas. Um, so the next building block is the lower layer super output areas. Um, minimum 400 households, 1,000 people, um, maximum 1,200 households and 3,000 people. And they're often used in public stati uh, published statistics, such as um, the index of multiple deprivation and recorded crime. Um, so they're useful kind of pointers that many of us will be familiar with. Um, and the larger area, the mid-layer super output area is um, 2,000 households, 5,000 people, and 6,000 households and 15,000 people. So quite akin to wards. And again, there's published statistics at this level, such as education attainment, when they were looking at COVID test results and mapping those during the pandemic. Um, there was a weekly data coming out at MSOA level. So um, a useful building block, probably one I would recommend, and just to illustrate the differences that this shows from the left, we have 
um, the private rented sector in, Mar in Manchester. So the darker the shading, the higher the level of the private rented sector. Um, so if you look at the um, brown blob towards the bottom, that's kind of located to the south of the university where there's a significant private rented sector. When we move on to LSOA geography, we get um, more detailed um, breakdown of those areas and we can see the variance in within those kinds of areas. And finally, on the right hand side, we get an output area geography, which gets really quite specific and you can begin to see how um, that homogeneity is led to clustering of kind of very high levels of private renting in and around the city centre and in the student corridor and up on the borders with Salford, I believe that is. The, the next thing to say, and this is probably the, the area where um, I feel most uncomfortable in a way because I'm um, going to end up recommending uh, you using a different source to the UK data service. Um, so just to say that for the individual variables, UK data service, NOMIS and ONS provide topic summaries for all of those individual variables. Um, that's kind of established. I think they are all available um, to pick from a long list um, and you can map those, those comfortably fit into output area level data. When we move to multivariate data, um, the UK data service and NOMIS currently present a defined set of tables. So they present the tables that have been released as defined tables by the ONS. And having done that, they also take the decision to present those tables with minimum suppression. Um, so what that means is that for some categories where we might be interested in a more detailed breakdown, such as ethnicity or household composition, um, we can't see it within the data provided by the UK Data Service and NOMIS. Um, whereas the ONS interface allows you to select variables to create a custom data set to select the number of categories. And the interface is quite fast and informs you of level of suppression due to the statistical disclosure control. Basically, let's have a look at what they've got. So in terms of data selection, um, NOMIS and UKDS have a list of tables in the UK data service site. Those tables have filters, so you can filter out particular things or filter in particular things you want to. Whereas in NOMIS, currently there is a long list um, that may well be developed, but I, when I checked it yesterday, that was the way it was coming out. ONS have, again, a list of predefined tables with filters, but they also have the option to build a custom data set. NOMIS and the ONS allow you to select data from particular geographies, whereas the UKDS at the moment, um, though it's intended to bring it in, currently only gives you the national data set from the geographies you select. So you need to um, clear out what you don't need for yourself. And then in terms of the output format, NOMIS gives you a table um, or tables. And that's kind of fine if the table you want is there um, and in the format you want it. Um, one of the things it will do when you go to multivariate data is potentially produce multiple tables for each variable. Um, I'm not sure and I've not played with the interface enough for 2021 to see if you can get it in long format, but it does mean some processing. Um, so for example, I was looking at religion and ethnicity and I ended up getting tables for each um, religion of all of the ethnic groups, which was kind of for for the geography I selected, which was local authority. Um, for ONS and UK data service, um, the, there's individual data. So you get a data line which holds each category combination and the number of observations. So I'll be demonstrating that later on. Um, but that is the kind of offering really from um, from the three. So for me, I've mainly used the ONS interface as it supports the level of detail I need. I do quite a lot of work around ethnicity and I found I can't really get that data. And in the ONS, finding a table, NOMIS and UKDS is quite time consuming. So I would tend to start with the builder custom data set. 
So the UKGS I know is undergoing development. There are plans to offer geographical selection, improved filtering, and more detailed categories. The mechanism for doing the more detailed categories will be to generate custom data sets and load them into UKDS. So to go down levels of geography as far as is possible um, without losing data. Both ONS and UKDS data need to be prepared and I'll demonstrate that later. Um, as I said, I think NOMIS provides data formatted, um, but you may get multiple tables. So in this session, the demonstration will use the ONS version. So the, the aim of um, the disclosure control is to protect, to protect confidentiality. And so what happens is they will, whilst it's generating data, it will dynamically swap records between areas when there are low counts, um, mostly within local authorities. And they use a selfie method for each table that changes the value by adding or subtracting one or two to the counts. So it leaves the overall totals unchanged and gives you consistent results. So um, in terms of looking at, at data, if you look at it today and you look at it in six months time, you should get the same results. Having done that, what they call selfie perturbation, they have a set of disclosure rules for tables and they tested for, they've tested those with 50 odd users attempting to find information about individuals for disclosure risk um, and found that I think they made one amendment to those disclosure rules and they were. So for me, surprisingly, I think they're quite generous. Um, so you do get quite low sound counts, which, and their rationale is you can't rely on those really being people in the same place. Um, so that's a kind of feature of it. So um, what, what that does mean though, is that low frequency characteristics across a large range of um, data may lead to empty cells. So for example, I found when using ethnicity that the no, no number of gypsy traveler and Roma being unevenly spread means if I try to take a countrywide approach at a lower geography, I won't get the data because there will be so many um, empty cells. Um, and that increases the likelihood of their suppression. So I think to address that, you need to probably focus on the geography you want and where areas are suppressed to go up a level to cover the gaps. So I'm going to move in a little bit to a demonstration, um, but this is the ONS front page, which I'll move on to. Um, the, so you can get standard tables, you can get the flexible table builder and topic summaries. Um, and looking at this, when you go, and I think this number has probably gone up, when you go into standard defined tables, you get a long list and a series of filters down the left. Um, so it's quite um, time consuming. So when you look in those, I'll demonstrate that later on, but um, it takes a while for it to filter down and you've still got quite a lot of scrolling through. Um, when you move into the custom data set, you get um, different types of variables. So you, your population type, you can select households, household reference persons, um, usual residents, and then usual residents in households and usual residents in communal establishments. Um, and in the example, I've gone for usual residents in communal establishments, I think, in, in households. Um, but just to have a look at where I arrived at, I was looking at housing deprivation by household composition and tenure um, in Greater Manchester. Um, and what I've got in this table is housing deprivation for different types of household types and the percentage of the total uh, number of that household type. Um, so if you look at that, you can see um, across the first line for a single person under 66, that um, levels of housing deprivation increase um, to 4% in the social rented sector and to 9% in the private rented sector. Um, 
as you move down that list, if I pick out the one that always um, strikes, it struck in 19, um, in 2011, sorry, was other households with dependent children. Um, so these are like to be either um, extended family households or um, people who are living in, in multi-households. And um, across all of the tenures, there are very high rates of housing deprivation. Now, the biggest indicator of housing deprivation is overcrowding. So you might say that's not that surprising, really. But 40% of those who own a right, 43% of those who own with a mortgage or a loan, 60% and 62% in the private rented sector. Um, so, so an interesting table for Greater Manchester to start digging into the data. Um, what I've done with the next one is to pick the borough I live in, which is um, Stockport, and to look at those counts and percentages on the same basis, but without the breakdown of household types. Um, so what you can see from there is um, relatively high levels compared to other tenures for those in social rented tenures uh, of housing deprivation. Um, but in some areas, quite small numbers. Right, so I'm going to now run um, a demonstration of how to get the data. Hopefully you can see the ONS front page there. And if I click on data and analysis from the census, um, I talked before about the census 2021 dictionary that's down there on that page. Um, there's a whole set of information about topics and um, some interactive stuff around um, building a custom area profile, which I haven't explored to be fair. So if I go into the get census data, this is the standard tables. So now there are 331. So if I take out aging, I'll leave demography, I'll take out education, ethnic group, health disability, So I've taken out quite a lot of data. I'm used to looking at housing and demography, and I've still got 67 results, um, which is quite a lot of tables. So I could probably find the table I wanted here. Um, but that's not necessarily, um, so that's gonna, I'm gonna just go back to the start, start again. Um, to create the same kind of output, I'm going to go in here. So um, as I said before, you will get um, these options. So I'm looking at all usual residents in households. Um, and it's defaulted to the area type of lower tier local authorities. So I'm going to change that to um, electoral wards and divisions. And I'm going to change the coverage. And I'm just going to select the those in a larger area. Now, for this example, I did it for 10 before, but I'm just going to go with one authority. And I searched for it and then add it. So now, um, if I continue, this will tell me I've got 32 areas available. The area type is electoral wards and divisions, and the coverage is for Manchester. So I can now go into adding a variable. And if I browse the available, very, um, available variables, I'm going to pick up um, household composition. I'm going to pick up household deprived in the housing dimension. I'm going to get tenure. So that's the table I demonstrated for Stockport, we will be able to recreate here for Manchester. So at the bottom of here, when I click continue, it will tell me how many areas are available. But it also tells me which um, household compositions it's selected. So here it's gone for six categories. I'm actually interested in more detail. So I'm going to go for 15 categories. 
which ha breaks down into pensioner households, those with children, those without, et cetera, um, in, in slightly more detail. So if I continue, those are still all available. Um, household deprivation is simply two categories and I'm happy with tenure. Um, so when you start to explore this, you may well find um, some of your areas are being suppressed. So you're forced to make decisions either about the geography or about the number of categories you're looking at. Um, and, and we'll talk a bit more about that when we come back to looking at it. But if I get the data, um, and here it then allows me to have it in different formats. So I'm gonna take it in Excel format and download it and open that file. Okay, so So um, the missing value here is minus eight. I'm just going to open some of these out so we can see them properly. Um, so in effect, we've got the geography, um, the household composition code and the household composition type, um, housing deprivation and um, the interpretation of that. And then um, tenure of household. So I'm first of all, I'm going to look at those missing data because they they behave strangely. So if I put a filter on and just pick one of these, if I take um, the housing deprivation first and click on minus eight, check if there are any observations. So. For many of the variables, there won't be any observations. For somewhere, there are cap, um, people who might be in your some in your population, but who won't have a category. You might find their accounts. So, for example, um, when you look at um, occupational variables like social class, um, you will find that there will be counts in those fields. So, I'm just going to delete those rows out. Turn the filter back off. And then do the same for tenure. Check whether there are any observations. There are none. And delete those. Take the filter back off. And then the same for household composition and there are none there so i'm going to delete those so i've now got rid of the missing values without losing any data um, the next thing i might want to do is to think about transforming um, these variables so if i look at this one here if we look down we've got one person households age 66 other um, other related families, sorry, let me extend that. Um, so I'm just gonna, so, so what you find when you go down this list is that you get um, a single family household married with dependent children. Um, as code four, as code seven, you get um, a cohabiting couple, family with no children. So those two from the analysis I want to do are the same. So I combine those two by using the filter to select four and seven, um, maybe reordering them in a way that I want to. So I, my preference in looking at this is to have those households um, who aren't pensioners below um, and have no children so single couples with no children, um, lone parents with no children, uh, sorry, um, other families uh, and other households um, together as the first group. So I would create a new variable and I'll show you what this looks like in a bit. So if I then say, look at tenure, 
I've got owns outright, owns with a mortgage loan or shared loan. I've got two categories for private renting. One includes um, rent free, and I've got two categories for social renting. So um, for my purposes, I've combined those two. So I'm not going to go through doing that online because I've prepared one earlier. So I'm just going to switch over to that. So here, this is the Greater Manchester data. So we've got the electoral wards and codes on the left. We've got the local authority that I've added in myself. Um, I've created a new value here for um, household composition, and I put them into an order. So we've got a single person, couple with no children, other family structure, other household, couple with dependent children, lone parent with dependent children, other household with dependent children, similar um, couple and lone parent with non-dependent children, and then single pensioner and pensioner family. Um, similarly with tenure, the new variable I've created is owns outright, owns with a mortgage or loan, social rented, private rented or rent free. Um, so I've got three questions that I'm just going to go um, here. So um, these are individuals, so I could have used the household one, so I'd be looking at households. Um, observation is the same as count, so it's the number of um, people in this case who fall into that category. Um, so what I've done when it's nil is to take it out. I'm just going to take those out. Um, I have got used to doing my recoding in Excel. Uh, you could do it in software. Um, I have wondered about doing it, but um, it's fairly quick for me in Excel. But it would be an option. So having, having created that data, the next stage would be to insert a pivot table. So to do that, you go to insert and pivot table, and it would open a new um, screen. So I'm just going to show you that screen now for local authorities. So here I've got for all local authorities, and this was the table I showed you, um, a set of data for each household type. So for this household type, those who aren't housing deprived and those who are housing deprived, I've then done some work to generate a field which says the number of housing deprived people and the percentage of the total of those two. So you can see that that gives a kind of reasonable picture. But if you were, say you were working in Greater Manchester, you wanted to look at the breakdown by different authorities, you could pick a different authority. And that would give you that picture. Um, you might want to do some tidying up so you can actually read it. Um, but let's have a look at this. Other households with dependent children um, are at that level in 36, 47, 58, 65. Let's try a different borough. Let's try um, Oldham. And if we look again across that um, other household with dependent children, we can see much higher levels there. So 54% who own outright, 55% with a mortgage, 72% social rented, and 73% private rented. So that has given us the kind of ability to look at um, data by creating this kind of pivot table structure with a function. You can look at the whole picture and then um, you could compare authorities with each other over to, yeah, by some work. Um, okay, Gemma, I'll come back to your question after. Um, I'll come back to those questions later when, when we've finished this demonstration. So the next um, area I developed for, again, inserting a pivot table, and that created the table we generated there um, that I showed you for the wards in um, Stockport. So I've set a filter here, which I've left on, I could change that to another authority and 
have a look at those figures for that authority and the wards in that authority. Okay, I will probably need to adjust depending on the number of wards. So I did that for Stockport, um, which has a certain number of wards. Bolton has one less. Manchester probably has more. So there might be a bit of playing around to do that. And then the last thing, for those of you who are going to get into mapping or who are thinking about it, um, this kind of data is not necessarily in the format you want. So I've just provided in this worksheet, and again, this will be on the shared page, um, some data on the map preparation. So this was a pivot table for an area of one of the variables. So I could have done something more complex. I would have had to create multiple roles. But this is an example. So I've just gone with household composition um, by area. And I've then worked on that. So I've taken that data using formula, um, using shorthand for the different types of families and putting them in the order I want them. And then on the right-hand side, generating um, percentages, which are the percentage of that group across all of the household types there. Um, so if I wanted to map particular household types in Manchester, um, so I wanted to see where couples with dependent children were, or if I wanted to combine families with dependent children, I might combine all three of those, um, the columns Q, R and S. Um, and that would give, I would be able to generate a kind of chloroplast map using that. So this example is in the worksheet that I will give to you. I think there's a question here about what happens if that doesn't give you that. I haven't gone through the details of what happens when you get um, statistical disclosure control suppresses data. Um, so there are two things you can think about. The first is to commission a data set from ONS. Now, my understanding is if you ask for a data set, um, they will give you all of the details. So one of the things you can't do with um, this data set is say, well, I'm not interested in this category that has a low count. You, you just get the area suppressed on that basis. So what you can ask them to do is to generate the category combinations that work for you. Uh, so that might be particularly useful if you're exploring ethnicity at a lower geographical level. And I think one of the um, projects going on in Belfast has done that and has generated that, which was used for a paper um, looking at deprivation ethnic, by ethnic group. Um, and the second thing you can do is explore the microdata. Now, what the microdata does is give you combined local authority level data, but it does give you multiple variables. So you can begin to explore some of the combinations for most urban areas at the ge urban geography. Um, so I think there's a couple of exceptions where um, that isn't true. And when you get into smaller districts, you may need to look at county level. But the microdata enables you to put in more variables than you can into this and probably answers one of the questions that came up before. So just some notes on the data. <clears throat> so the, the data sets on households, household reference persons and usual re residents can go down to output area level. Um, for residents in communal establishments and the usual residents in households, that only goes down to MSOA level, which is why I used ward, it would have been easy to use either of them, but it needs a larger population size because that's the decision made. So if I wanted to look at households at NSOA level, I would need to request a data set, um, commission a data set. And the obvious thing, uh, thing to say is there'll be more limitations on the number of categories available as you look at smaller areas. Um, it's potentially significant where you have a number of categories. So I did, in preparing for this, think about using ethnic categories at LSOA level and found quite high levels of suppression where I tried to include other variables. Um, household composition is only available through that interface at MSOA level. Um, and I suppose one of the ways to address this is to think about a phased approach to answer the question so you can overcome that issue. So the last thing I'm going to say before I come to the Q&A, um, 
is just about the process of doing this. So I would say plan out what you want to find out. Um, Open-end exploring is interesting, but you're more likely to waste time uh, from personal experience. Um, document the steps you take, particularly if it's not something you're like, you know, something you might want to come back to in six months' time. You won't necessarily remember, so you'd have to go back and find out. So if you write a short outline of the steps you've taken um, and try to separate out your calculations so you don't write the overwrite original data. So in my case, I use formula in Excel. If you were using a programmatic solution, you would just be generating another file. Um, thank you very much for coming.